Good afternoon. My name is Jose. His name is Nata. And today we're going to speak about a, a control system of light intensity and its color temperature. So this is the index of our presentation. First, we are going to give a brief introduction of the reasoning behind this project uh, about the theory of both color theory and the uh, color temperature, temperature term, how the human eye works with light, and then about the control system specified, the circuit that you use to assimilate the lab, this is the push pull mosa driver, the PID controller, the sensor that you use it, and then the results. Uh, first of all, the introduction. Uh, the reasoning behind this project is the control of light, of light intensity and of color and of light temperature. Uh, the lamp that we use to this project was a LED lightning, and the reason behind this is since on the last years there is a there has been happening a great uh, a great transition between uh, bulb lamps towards LED lamps. Since the last year, it has already sold 7.8 billion LED lamps during on the whole globe. So this was the reason that you chose to use a LED lamp. And the reason behind the project itself is uh, the control of both temperature of the light and the intensity of the lights are really important to our to our to the health of our eyes. Since if you're in a room and there isn't a proper control of both intensity or the color, it can be it can damage the human system. Since like you light a lamp and there is a really a really high intensity, and then it accommodates in a proper signal. In this really high intensity, it can damage your eyes because we are not so sensitive to this. So the reason is the is the well care of our humans about light in the human eye. We all know that light is a phenomenon that occurs in light, and all this, uh, the visible spectrum of light uh, happens between 280 nanometers and, seven, and 760 nanometers. That is as shown in the graph. For the highest uh, wavelengths, we have the red light. Uh, higher than this, higher than the 760 nanometers, we have infrared that is out, that is not visible anymore to our eyes. And then towards the minor, the minor size of wavelength, so we have 380 nanometers that's violet, and lower than this is ultraviolet that is also not visible for human eyes. So this is the spectrum, but our eyes can properly see like, oh, they can distinguish that a uh, color is properly yellow, is properly green. The way our eyes sense light is in three different ways, because the cells of our eyes sense three different kinds of lights, the blue light, the green light, and the red light. So we can sense all the, we can sense all the directly colors, uh, all the colors direct, directly. We sense some of, we sense, is, uh, all our, the lights that we sense with our eyes are some of blue, a kind of blue tone, a green tone, and a red tone. That is show here, uh, on, that will be show after. So every light that we see is between, between uh, white, that is the maximum sum of the red, green, and blue values, and black, that is the minimum sum of red, green, and blue, blue values. So we can study the kind of lights. It will specify a color theory, because only studying lights, like lights intensity or lights color isn't a good way to you put like in mathematical equations or in control systems. So a uh, really great, great number of color theories were specified. And the most common color theory is the red, green, blue theory. That is to match our eyes. So it is determined that every color, every color that exists can be determined by a sum of red color, a green, a green tone, and a blue tone. And for the this color theory, these are considered the primary colors. And it's different of like primary colors when you're using ink because it's like how the colors really work when you are painting something and you mix them. This is the mathematical way of, of mixing colors, not the realistic way. So this is what I said before. There are uh, different tones of blue, red, and green. If you sum all of them, you have white. And then if you mix, like, not the maximum value, you have 
middle terms values between white. So you have like mixing blue and green, you have seen in other examples. This Venn's diagram is really limited because it doesn't show all the possible tones that you can have. Like, it's not so black and white. This is not like I'll have blue and red, and you have properly magenta. If you have a stronger blue than red, you have a, a magenta that is more towards blue than red. And so it goes through every kind of mix that you can make. Uh, the color system mathematic can be described by these three equations, these three integrals. That red is an integral in the whole wavelength of light of a multiplication of, uh, of two functions. One function is the intensity, so how intense a signal is in that wavelength, and the tones of red that the wavelength has. So you can say like, uh, the lower case red, green, blue, you can say like, uh, 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 color is red for this function only because it can be red, but like it can be a bright red or it can be a dark red. So you need to do the multiplication of these both signals to reach the true tone of red. And the same goes as green as blue. The other system is like it's summing a dark tone of red and, uh, and uh, a lighter tone of red. It's just a simplification from the generic case. So having talked about the color theory as a whole, we're now going to talk about some color spaces that are useful to our work, such as the CIE, XYZ color space. The CIE is the International Commission, International Illumination Commission, which is like the organ that publishes research about the human eye and how colors work with the human eye, and luminotechnics as a whole. So, in 1931, they published uh, some studies concerning something that was akin to a pattern human eye. Because not, not all human eyes are, are, are equal to each other. They're all different. But they got something like a standard human eye, which is their XYZ color system, which, mm, where they invented three new variables called the XYZ. The most important of these three is the Y, because Y sim symbolizes um, light intensity. And the, through the X and Z, you can extrapolate chromaticity coordinates, which describe all types of colors existing in, in the world. So, we call them two stimuli because the XYZ, originally they are like the representation of the cones and rods of the human eye, such as this. Here we have the, that curve that has been presented before, which is the human eye curve, and this is the XYZ curve. In this case, the lowercase x, y, and z are the color functions that, that we call them. So you can see the, the z uh, emulates the small cones and so forth. And, as I said, through the XYZ system, we can extrapolate the CIE XYZ system to the CIE XYY system, in which we have a lower case Y and a higher case Y. Because the higher case Y is the light intensity and the XY can describe a, a plane of colors, such as this. Here we have, like, you can imagine this in 3D, so the light intensity is an axis going out of the board. So you have all kinds of colors in this shape. And this is the plane that the X and Y, the lower cases, describe. Um, yeah. And through both of these, through the chromaticity coordinates, X and Y, and the uppercase Y, which is the uh, light intensity, we can describe the correlate color temperature through our system. Where I'm going to explain this afterwards, but right now I'm going to explain the <laughs> color temperature, which is like imagine Planck's, uh, Planck, the scientist, imagine his black body. In his theory, he says that if you heat a uh, black body, it will assume different colors through different temperatures. 
So we can assign, like, blue light is, can be considered as a, um, white light actually, can be considered as a black body. Our LEDs can be, con can be considered as a black body. So, like, we have 1000 Kel uh, Kelvin with degrees. A black body would light up with a color that's similar to candlelight. 10,000 Kelvin, a uh, black body would light up a color that's bluish. So why is it important to know what's correlate color temperature and how to control it? Because human beings live in various uh, environments. environments. So in your, in your home, you don't want a, a light that's too bright or too hot, as we say, because it, your brain gets all turned up and it starts working more and more. You want to relax. And to relax, you would like something akin to 3000 Kelvin or 2000 Kelvin in a lamp, which is a hotter color, for example. So you can relax. And to a work environment, you want a, you want a white light because your, your brain works better with white light. You stay awake, for example. And knowing how, how to control this in an, in an ambient is really useful and it's one of the purposes of, of our project. Uh, only another thing about color temperature, temperature too. There is like, is normally known that, for example, red is a hot color and that blue is like a cold color. This go backwards when you're speaking about the color temperature. They're like, blue here is like 10,000 Kelvin, so it's a hot color, and red, kind of red is like 1,000 Kelvin. So it's backwards yeah. of what you normally Because you know. think in the temperature and not the color itself. These color temperatures? Yes. Like, imagine that uh, the light of an LED, a LED, is something that can be modeled as a black body from Planck. And do you remember that when, when you heat a black body, it will, uh, it will emit light in various colors, such as this. So you can say that a light can emit a color, you can, like, Correlationate um, based on the, on, on, the on, on Planck's black body. You can correlationate to to a to a LED lamp. So, having spoken about the theory behind the control system, about the color temperature theory and the color intensity, we are going to speak about some of the electronic components that we use to make the control system. So, first of all, in order to 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 control a LED, normally we are going to use a PWM to control this because generating a PWM, we can modulate since from uh, with the dot cycle of the square wave, uh, how high or how or how low the average voltage is going to the source to the LED. Sorry. But we can like uh, feed the feed the LED lamps from the PWM itself because. PWM normally it's something like that goes out from a microcontroller or from an amp -op. And the, normally the maximum output currents from the microcontroller is like 200 milliampere. And it won't be much, uh, 200 milliampere is going to be much higher than this. And when you isolate a LED, you need to like 5 ampere, doesn't, uh, tenths of ampere. So it's not a good way to isolate this. So what do we use? We use a MOSFET driver, a MOSFET circuit. Uh, power MOSFET, so a power MOSFET will provide all the currents that you need to actuate the LED. But then you have another problem, because the power MOSFET has a really high, uh, high capi capacitance on its entrance, so it needs a really high voltage, and since a high voltage, a high current to load it, to load it. So we need a high voltage to be able to actuate the MOSFET and so actuate the LED. And the PWM again isn't able to supply this voltage. So you use a push-pull circuit with two TBJs, and this push-pull circuit are go is going to be able to spread this current. This is the model of the circuit this is this I was used. Uh, here you have the MOSFET driver that is going to feed the lamp, and you hit, you, in here you have the PWM. What the push-pull circuit does is, when, uh, when you have an entrance of the PWM, this, for example, you have a high entrance here. 
this transistor is going to close, and then we have zero voltage here. And because of what? It's going to open. It's going to open. No, high you're going to close. High signal. Yeah, yeah. It's going to close. And you have you're going yeah. to have zero voltage here. What the circuit does have? This just zero voltage that is on the X of this transistor is going to be kind of copied because by the push pull to the entrance of the MOSFET. But since these transistors are connected to both your sources, so both to DND and both to 12 volt source, all the current is going to pass through this transistor. So basically, you have a voltage entrance, entrance uh, entering here. You will copy this voltage to the MOSFET entrance, but the current won't be, won't be, won't be coming from here. It will be coming from your source directly. So like here you have 200 million pairs, but you need 10 pairs on the MOSFET. Ah, but you don't have to worry about that because the 10 pairs is going to be directly from the source. You won't burn your Arduino, you won't burn the MPOP that you're using. So this is the principle of the push-pull circuit. Yeah, and we're, we're doing this because the MOSFET, when you're, you, lead, you deal with it like a load, you can see it as a capacitive load. So you need a transient current in his gate to, to turn him on. And with power MOSFETs, this transient can, current can be quite high. So that's why we use the, the push-pull circuit. So it uh, amplifies our, our current without uh, damaging the, damaging the, the, the waveform of the, of the voltage. And another thing that's used that's really basic for a control system is a PID control. PID control is like a generally accepted way, a network of control systems. It has been used a long time ago and it really works well. And it's divided by three different parts. So you have PID, you have the proportional part, the integrative, the integrative part, and the derivative part. The three parts has both negative sides and positive sides to your answer. So here, it's an example of your control system. Here you have your entrance, and then you have the response for the control systems. Depending on, on, how, on how high or how low each one of these parts is, it will damage your answer. For not damage, but to like give a bad answer. For example, you have if you have a, a high pro, a high proportional part, the answer is going to be really slow. So, for example, for a lamp, when you achieve a lamp, it will like take microseconds until the lamp lights up. That is a good thing, that is not too But if the proportional part is too big, you also have a big overshoot. So imagine like you light a lamp, the answer is fast, but like the intensity of the light is too big. And then, for example, you, you have a, a just wake up and you are in a dark room. If you light a lamp and the intensity is too big, it can damage your eyes because it's not a environment that you are accustomed to. So this is a problem of the proportional part. The integrative part is kind of similar. It also lowers the, lowers the rising the time of the answer, but it high, gets higher overshoot. But another thing is it, it makes the error of in your permanent regime zero. So every regime permanent is you have a reference and you have your exit in the control system. When the, your exit will be equal to your reference value, but if you only use only proportional part, it will be like it will have a small mistake between these two, these two signals. So the integrative part will zero this mistake. So you always will have on your output the same value that you have in your reference. And the derivative part is kind of the opposite of these two. It lowers, the, it lowers the overshoot part of the circuit, but it takes longer to your, your system to answer. So it, will, it won't be so, so bright when you light up the lamp, but it will take longer. And also this makes your system more stable. So like there is a higher chance if you don't manage the value cell, it won't work properly. Mm. Here are only some curves that show how the answer values depending on the control system. Here you have the only integrative part that is low. So the answer is low, but doesn't have not doesn't have anything of overshoot. There is k, ki equals 2, so it is a really quick response, but it has a high overshoot. And there it has the most complete system, more com, most complete kind of control system, that is the 3 kp, ki, kd. That will be like, it's not so fast, but it's not so slow either. It has intermediate overshoot and then like has a proper time to answer, to stabilize. 
So, having talked about the control system and the, and the power circuit, we have to talk about the sensor we used in our project because we have to feed the input stage of our system with the output uh, response. We use the TCS3414 uh, sensor. It's a digital color sensor with 16 bits of resolution. Uh, being a color sensor, it was designed to work like the human eye, so it has a matrix of photodiodes that some capture blue light better than others, or red light or green light, so it, it's done with the proportion to work like a, a human eye, to give the, the answer of a human eye, for example. But we don't use it actually as a color, color sensor. We, from the color values, we extrapolate the uh, intensity, in, in the light intensity levels and the color temperature levels. So we use it as a light intensity and color temperature sensor. Here we have, like, we, we treat the RGB system and the XYZ system as algebraical spaces, and we do, do some transformations, some space transformations, so that we can, can transform RGB values to XYZ values. Having the XYZ values extrapolated from the RGB values, we can do the, we can find the lowercase x and lowercase y, which are the chromaticity coordinates, and from this we can have, we can find uh, an n. This n used is used in Maccami's formula, which is the formula we use is a purely em empirical formula to, cal to calculating color temperature, color, color temperature. So with this we have the uppercase y which is the light intensity, and we have the color temperature, which are the two va variables we want to control in our system. So, now we're going to talk about our results. This was a research project done with uh, Vil uh, Vilela, the, the professor here in the, in the parkland. This is the board layout in, the, in, in Proteus, uh, PCB so, uh, design software. This is the board in physically. We used two LED strips in our system. So we had one LED strip of 2,700 Kelvin and another one of 5,000 5, Kelvin. So we had like a cold one and a hot lamp. So we could, we could like balance the, the system okay. And this is the the overall response of our system. In yellow, we have the color temperature reference. We have some spikes in here, but it's because of the potentiometer we used. And in blue, we have the color temperature. As you can see, the, the answer of the variable doesn't match up with the reference, but that's because we've projected the, the system to work like with cell phone lamps uh, as a disturbance. So their uh, cell phone lamps have a really high temperature as compared to our LED lamps. So this offset here is because we were at PK8, so there was ambient light, and this, this project is, was done with ambient light in, in mind. Uh, in, in purple, we have the luminosity reference, and in red, we have the luminosity itself. Same thing, we were, were working with a higher disturbance of a cell phone lamp, which is much brighter than our, our LEDs. So, the logic we used to, in this to, to make the, this control system was like, I have a hot LED and a cold LED. So I want to increase the color temperature. So I need to decrease the, the cold value and increase the, the hot value. The, so the cold lamp turns off and the hot lamp turns on. Same thing with, if you want to turn down the, the color temperature values. 
But if you want to turn on your luminosity values, you want both of, of your lamps to to turn on or turn off. If you want them to if you want a less bright bright light. So you have to deal with both situations. You have to compensate themselves. The color temperature and the, the light intensity will compensate themselves, as you can see here. When light started to, to act up, the color temperature had a, a rise and some variation because it was compensating itself. So we have to think about two variables at once. And this is it. Thank you very much.